Our next speaker, Rob Hone, is a former Save the River intern. It is a co-founder of CEO, co-founder and CEO of IdeaScale. Rob? Yes, thank you. All right, give me just a minute here. We good there? Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. All right, great. Um, I am so excited to be here presenting at Frink Snowplows. This is great. <laughs> that's, a, that's a joke for the old timers. Um, yes, I, I also used to be an uh, intern at Save the River. Um, and now I'm the CEO of a startup in the Bay Area. I live in Berkeley, California. Um, and uh, I just want to say thank you real quick to Save the River for having me. Thank you for everyone that put on this amazing event. I heard a couple rumors that this is the largest in attendance. So awesome. Thank you, water levels, I guess. <laughs> right? Um, really quickly, um, so my, uh, my journey with environmentalism actually started at Save the River. So uh, I always laugh. I think like... Uh, we have a place on Round Island, and uh, we're on the backside, and the sewer pipe actually goes right through my yard from the old Frontenac Hotel and goes right into the river. So, you know, in those early days, I, I understood pretty quickly that you're not supposed to put sewage in the river. Um, and uh, I definitely spent some time uh, mucking around in swamps uh, with John Farrell, uh, trying to catch... Um, musky and try to stay away from all the uh, leeches and stuff. Uh, definitely tested a lot of sewer tanks, you know, did all that cool stuff, right, you do as a kid. Um, and I went to TI, so I'm a local as well, and a summer resident, um, and I live in California, so it's kind of all those things in one. Um, so I just want to tell you quickly about um, how I started to kind of get into climate change. Uh, I bought a Tesla in 2015. I wanted to reduce my carbon footprint. And uh, we started buying solar power. So we were completely carbon neutral when it came to transportation. Um, and it came time to go to the river. We go to the river every summer, right? So around June. And uh, I was thinking, like, I said to my wife over dinner, I wonder, uh, I wonder if we could just drive. <laughs> I know, yeah, exactly. I know, you're thinking kids, like the whole thing, right? And actually, we went out in the car, and there's this big, beautiful screen with a trip planner. We sat down in there, and we, like, typed in, Round Island, New York, go. And it computes, and um, it turns out you can, right? There's, there's chargers all along all the major highways. This is actually in 2015. Um, and uh, so we did it. And we've been doing it for five years. <laughs> This is me potty training uh, with my son. <laughs> I was really into potty training then. <laughs> um, so we do a lot of stops along the way. We visit friends and family. Um, my wife has a lot of friends in the Midwest, which is cool. So my kids get to experience all the parts of the country. <laughs> Dinosaur Museum in Utah, they love that. This is uh, 2018 in uh, Medicine Bow. So more and more routes have opened up because there's more superchargers that Tesla makes. So we kind of take different routes and wander different places. Um, this is like the typical dad shot where you're trying to like coordinate and it didn't work and it ended up being great. Um, but another thing that happened that year was that um, a little bit about me is that I enjoy like charts and spreadsheets and science and all that stuff. My fun uh, weekend could be cozying up to a spreadsheet, you know, just hanging out with a spreadsheet. And someone said to me, like, hey, Rob, you know, like, Al Gore will actually, like, teach you how to talk about climate change for three days uh, for free, and he'll sit you down for hours on end and regale you with spreadsheets and charts. I was like, oh, this is great. Sign me up. I'm totally going. This is awesome. Um, and during the course of that road trip, one of the things that we learned is that there are a lot of people that are really interested in the issue and have tons of questions. 
And the same thing you learn when you go through this program is that it's really about communication and education around climate change. We all actually believe that it's real. 90% of people believe that it's real, but no one really knows much about it or what to do about it, like about technology and stuff like that. Um, and I actually happen to study innovation and change as part of my job, which we won't get into now because I don't have time. Um, so I did that training, and today we're going to rip through it. I usually do this like in an hour, so bear with me. I'm going to talk really fast, strap in. Don't worry, there's cocktails later tonight, so you can, uh, you can deal with all the depressing information I'm going to give you. So um, the, the way to think about this is really in three parts, right? It's like, must we change? Do we, do we need to do this, right? And um, can we change? Do we have the technology to make the, the change? And will we? And that's always the hardest part, right? So we'll start with must we change. Now, um, you guys probably know, there's still a lot of debate about climate change, amazingly enough. Um, but Mother Nature is now involved in the debate, and she is actually pretty persuasive. Um, this is planet Earth taken the first time we went there. We didn't land, as you probably remember, but we orbited. Um, and uh, someone took a photo of planet Earth, and I, it's one of my favorite photos. Um, it's the first time we actually thought of planet Earth as a shared home. And uh, just as a quick refresher, uh, this is Earth. There's a lot of like, you are here slides, so be prepared. Um, this is Venus, uh, closer to the sun, and this is Mars. Now Mars um, has a thin atmosphere. Venus has a much thicker atmosphere. Um, and Earth kind of has that nice sweet spot. It's about 59 degrees average surface temperature on Earth. Um, a common misconception is that Mercury is hotter than Venus. It's actually not true. It's the other way around. Venus is hotter because, guess what? It has a thicker atmosphere and runaway climate change. It's already happened, right? So we can get a little preview of what's to come, right? <laughs> um, so um, this is actually a really cool shot of the atmosphere from the side. And you guys are all boat people, so just to give you a, an idea of how thin our atmosphere is. If you took a globe and painted it with varnish, one coat, not four, painted one coat of varnish, um, that's how thin our atmosphere is, right? And actually, if you hopped in your boat and drove straight up to the top, you'd probably, depending on how fast your boat is, um, you'd probably get there in about a half an hour. So it's, it's pretty uh, thin layer. Um, and you might not have seen this before, but I'm just gonna quickly explain what's happening, okay? So uh, solar radiation from the sun comes down through our atmosphere, actually, uh, and warms the earth when it hits the ground. Most of that radiation is absorbed by the earth and warms it, of course. Um, but actually, some of that actually bounces back off into space uh, as infrared energy. Um, but since it's now infrared, some of it actually hits the atmosphere and bounces back down and warms the Earth again, right? Um, okay, here we go. We are actually spewing 110 million tons of um, pollution into the uh, atmosphere every 24 hours, and we're basically treating it like an open sewer, just like the uh, sewer pipe on Round Island. <laughs> um, and what happens is, as the thin shell of the atmosphere gets thicker, more of that radiation bounces back down to Earth and warms it more than it did before. And less of that is escaping into space. Uh, there's a lot of causes of this. Um, these greenhouse gases and, uh, you know, methane, a few other different things. Um, but we're going to talk mostly about CO2 and, uh, you know, obviously coal plants, in industrial agriculture, things like that, all, all cause that. Um, but we'll probably, we're going to mostly focus on the burning of um, fossil fuels. So uh, this is basically uh, just a graph of uh, billions of tons over time. And you can see there, um, let me get the hang of the pointer here. Uh, right after World War II, we really got cranking there. Um, uh, talk to me later, I, uh, but this little section right here is actually really interesting. Um, basically, that's a period of huge economic expansion with no increase in CO2 emission. Um, got, got us really excited for a few years there. Um, so 
really quickly, we'll just kind of even look further back in time, like 800,000 years, right? Um, the river uh, was covered uh, just in the last ice age there. You can see, um, oh wait, sorry, I gotta go ahead. This is a fancy slide with temperature and CO2. So um, scientists can actually kind of figure out the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere by drilling for ice cores. Um, and they can also surmise temperature. So we can look back uh, 800,000 years and kind of see the correlation there, right? Um, so in the last ice age, uh, you know, there were about two kilometers of ice um, right here, I think, in the river. Um, another UR here slide real quick. We just hit 415 parts per million. And um, if we keep going at that rate, we'll just make that a little bigger. This is 40 more years. And summer temperatures have shifted. This is deviation from the mean. Um, there's 83 to 93, 94, 04 to 2015. And uh, now we have um, a lot more extreme temperature events, right? And so we can see that if we just, just measure the surface temperature of the Earth, right? Uh, 18 of the 19 hottest years on record, I actually need to update this slide, sorry, um, have occurred since 2001 alone, so um, it's, it's pretty drastic. And the hottest have been in the last five years. So, and we're seeing um, record-breaking heat everywhere, right, just recently. Here's uh, Paris in 2019, 115, Whew, man, it's brutal. Uh, in India, some people have died, uh, actually, sorry, 600 people are hospitalized in Japan. Australia, 121, and here's right here in Manhattan, 110. Also Montreal, 90 people died, actually. Um, and, you know, in 2018, 224 locations set all-time heat records. Uh, heat content also has increased quite dramatically, uh, and this is actually showing the depth down in the ocean, which is actually kind of interesting, and half of those increases have occurred just in the last 20 years. Uh, also, the ocean actually has heat waves, so we track those as well, and that incidence has increased quite a bit. Um, so real quickly, how does uh, climate change affect hurricanes? So warmer oceans lead to more intense hurricanes. Um, those hurricanes in intensify more rapidly. Um, and then that, as you, we've heard a few times now, the warmer air actually holds more moisture, leading to heavier downpours, right? Um, and then, yeah, of course, storm surge from sea level rise, which we've seen like uh, a few times. And uh, a wavier jet stream, which I have slides for, but I cut for time, so you can take Fahrenheit hotter than normal. <clears throat> and we had a lot of heroic people uh, rescuing uh, everybody. <clears throat> this is in Mozambique in 2019. This is in Jersey. A lot of flooding photos here. Um, you guys, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a good audience here. You guys know the hydrological cycle really well, so I don't have to get into that too much. Um, as you can imagine, I think one of the important takeaways, though, is, as we've said a few times in, in the talks today, um, warmer air holds more moisture, right? And in addition to that, hotter temperatures increase evaporation. So we, um, it kind of stresses the hydrological cycle uh, much more, right? And uh, we see that. We have a new weather phenomenon. Um, Meteorologists call this the rain bomb. This is in uh, Montana. And this is a rain bomb in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And of course you get flooding, right? This is uh, last year in Minneapolis. Russia. Kalamazoo. A lot of crop issues uh, in Nebraska. This is my favorite slide, I always, I always leave this one in. The dedication is amazing, right? They had this huge flood, this bar actually stayed open. Um, <laughs> which is totally awesome. Um, 
And uh, just this year, you know, we recorded the wettest period on record in the United States. And I, I always hear this, I'm like, why do they still call it thousand year floods? But anyway, <laughs> did you ever wonder that? Uh, <laughs> um, so in, in the record breaking participation anomalies continue to increase. And um, actually, uh, just general worldwide extreme weather events as well. Um, this is actually tracked by the insurance industry, which is kind of interesting. And uh, the economic losses from the last two years equal about $650 billion. So let's talk a little bit about ice. Um, the, uh, both caps are melting pretty extensively. And uh, this is a glacier in Greenland. Um, I gotta be honest with you, Al always shows this and it's like, I don't know, it's just weird because it doesn't show his whole body, I don't know, anyway. Um, but this, this is a, uh, this is a um, daytime flooding event, which is very common in Miami. Um, so basically, uh, certain high tides and, and surges, um, the city of Miami will be flooded um, and you end up with things like this. And if you look at the top 10 cities at risk by population, uh, we see Miami there. Oh wait, sorry, Mumbai, Miami's down there. Um, but uh, if you look at it by assets, uh, Miami is actually uh, the, the biggest at risk and then number three there is New York. And the other places in the US too that have uh, record flooding during high tides. Obviously, uh, a lot of our Earth is covered in ocean, so a lot of that extra heat that's trapped by pollution um, goes right into the ocean. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, this is actually another common thing that I was not aware of, is that, so we have all that evaporation on the water, but on land, it actually dries out the soil, right? And um, as a result, you get more, um, uh, dry spells, right, and um, everyone running out of water. You get a lot of drought, um, and also plants and vegetation completely dry out, and you get more forest fires as well. This is South Africa. Uh, Cape Town actually is pretty close to running out of water in 2018. Iran experienced a drought over 97% of the country. So like I said, uh, you get drier vegetation, you got to increase load on forest management, and you get more fires. This is kind of uh, hits close to home, out in California. That's in Europe. This is at Alberta. South Korea. And the fire season is actually 105 days longer than it used to be. This is paradise. We, we actually, so we're 150 miles away um, from Paradise in Berkeley, and we, we had to wear masks in our house. And we had an air filter and all that stuff, so that smoke travels very far, right? It affects a lot of people. This is another large fire in California. And the three most expensive fires in the world actually are in California just in the last couple of years. Even Sweden. <laughs> England, Chile, yes, Australia. So this is actually in March, right? Um, so they actually had a bunch of bushfires before, um, and then of course now. Um, I just heard the stat; they just updated it. It's one billion animals have died from this fire so far. In Russia. The state of emergency now there with this fire back in July, or not now, sorry, then. Um, and even the Department of Fe Defense has actually come out and said, like, climate change is a serious issue, right? And uh, populations of marine vertebrates have declined. And we're looking to lose about 50% of all our land-based species. Okay, so uh, the cost is huge. Now again, I'm trying to condense this down to 35 minutes. Um, 
the director's cut covers almost all of these things. <laughs> um, but the cost is pretty crazy, right? So I think it's pretty clear that we should probably do something about this problem. Would you guys agree? Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, one other thing that makes me absolutely pull my, ha my hair out, uh, I talk a lot about renewables. And uh, probably one of the biggest uh, complaints I hear from people is like, well, what about all the subsidies, right? Well, I just want to remind you that fossil fuels has a lot of subsidies, 5.2 trillion globally, right? Uh, and in the US, uh, we're looking at 609. Whoops, sorry. I got to keep going. Got to make it on time. So must we change? Yes, we must change, right? So. Now, I know you guys might all be like a little bit depressed, um, but this is kind of the fun part because now we get to talk about, you know, change and technology and all that stuff. We have a lot of solutions at hand, um, and I'm just going to give you a quick tour of a few key technologies that we see um, in, in, uh, in the marketplace. Um, so this is, uh, now, this is a, a projection of worldwide wind capacity that was made in 2000. There's a very common thing in this space is that everyone makes a projection and they're wrong by a lot, right? Um, so reality, actually in 2018, we exceeded that by 20x, okay? Um, and, uh, and it's really dramatic to see the, the global wind energy capacity right now. And mainly because the cost has come down. It's cheaper, right? It's awesome. Um, now, globally, actually, wind could supply all of our energy 40 times over, just wind. It's incredible. Um, so much so that states like Texas and Iowa were really leading the way in wind energy. Um, Texas actually gives away energy at night. It's kind of cool. Um, in Texas, they actually produced more uh, wind power than coal, which is kind of cool. Uh, in Germany, uh, they've provided more power than uh, their coal plants just in 2018. Portugal actually produces uh, net positive. They have extra energy. I don't even know what to do with it. <laughs> um, and in Scotland, they produced enough energy for all their households. T uh, two, two times over, actually. This is in uh, the UK, where they produce three times as much than coal. And actually, two-thirds of the global population lives in a country where solar and wind are the cheapest, which is so cool, right? That's awesome. That's what we want to see. Now, solar is even more interesting. Uh, it was projected that they would get to one gigawatt um, back in two, 2002 by 2010, and that was exceeded by, uh, let's see, I think it was about 17 times, and then again, uh, it was exceeded by 109 times. Solar is blowing up, actually. It's incredible. And uh, a lot of that is actually because of the cost. The cost is coming down. Um, we're looking at about 25 cents per, per watt right now. Um, and you, you've probably seen solar installations everywhere. I saw one just on 12. I didn't even know it was going up. It's incredible. Um, so, uh, and what's really interesting is similar to that previous stat about wind, there's actually enough solar energy that hits the earth every hour to supply all of the entire world's needs for the entire year. So there's that huge free solar generator in the sky. This is a quick chart of how we allocate our land use. Because a lot of questions come up around like, okay, well, how much land do we need if we wanted to power all of the U.S., for example, with solar energy, right? Um, it turns out it's about the size of Rhode Island, um, or I, I like this slide better because you can kind of figure out like what sport or activity you don't like. So uh, <laughs> I'm not much of a golfer, so I could live without golf. Um, it's, but it's about, it's about that or maybe how much we allocate to maple syrup. So it's not very much. <laughs> um, so uh, Germany actually produced 100% of their energy um, in 2018. Um, the reason why I like to point out some of these countries is because uh, Germany is actually kind of cloudy, right? Um, uh, out in California, we actually got to 73% of our electricity generation back in uh, 2018. Even the Vatican's on board. <laughs> uh, and I actually found out, I think this just went public yesterday, Clarkson, is that right? Yeah. Clarkson um, is uh, going to, they're on track to reach uh, net, uh, yeah, 
100% renewables by 2025. Um, I'm going to go quickly on this, but these are kind of some of the other countries and what kind of energy they're producing. Important because India is, uh, I think, third or fourth largest emitter. And this is uh, Europe. And here's the U.S. I guess we're kind of into natural gas. <laughs> uh, this is the Kentucky Coal Mining Museum, which also has solar on the roof. <laughs> so good for them, good for them. Hey, it's a museum, right? That's, that's all right. Uh, some of these countries are actually really interesting, and um, when we study innovation and change, you have a leapfrog effect, right? So, you know, we all used to have landlines, and then it took a while, and we eventually got cell phones, and then, you know, we make fun of people with landlines, right? So that transition took a long time, right? In some countries, we actually see that transition leapfrog. So, peop, you know, in some, in some parts of the world, they, they, were, they went to install landlines. They said, well, wait, why don't we just use cell phones? It's so much easier. And everyone just went straight to cell phones. Um, solar is kind of an, a, 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 another really common example of this because you see uh, countries building out their grid and their transmission lines and all this stuff and using coal or, or they, they uh, have proposed coal plants. And then they realize, well, wait why don't we just go with sol solar or wind? It's so much cheaper, right? Um, and the Chilean solar market is really, really interesting. The amount of in-process energy is phenomenal. Um, <laughs> you have to like sit there and wait, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so about 16 gigawatts, it's really impressive. And uh, again, uh, India, the same way. Uh, <laughs> but again, because they're, they're such a um, large consumer of coal right now, it's obviously really important for them to make that transition. So quickly, I just want to talk a little bit about storage. Um, there's another common um, sort of myth. I mean, we, like energy nerds debate me about this, but a lot of people think of the grid as a battery. Um, it's not really a battery in the traditional sense. It can't really store that much energy. Yes, you can like put power back into the grid and it might go to your neighbor. Um, but when you need to do that at scale, you actually need to store energy in a battery. Um, so uh, what's really interesting about the uh, storage space uh, is that it's, of course, projected to grow dramatically, um, but the price has dropped so fast and we actually have laptops and cell phones to thank for that right um, because as more and more people buy cell phones and computers um, they need lithium batteries and uh, basically as you make more of something it gets cheaper that's actually called Wright's law which is super cool um, and we are taking advantage of that quite uh, dramatically um, the price got down to about hundred and forty dollars per kilowatt hour in uh, 2019 um, and a little fun fact, what's kind of interesting is once it gets to 100, um, that will make an electric car cheaper than a gas car. So it's coming pretty quick. Um, this is a, a grid scale battery that Tesla makes. This is the largest lithium battery in the world. I think there's bigger ones now, um, but this one went in in about 2017. Um, Little cool thing about the grid, uh, there are peaks, right? Like maybe around five o'clock you come home, you flip on your Xbox or whatever, you take a shower. Everybody does that at once and there's a huge spike in the grid, right? Um, so all the guys at the factories have to run over and in the old days they'd start sco scooping more coal, right, into, into, the, into the furnace. Um, but there's a special type of power plant called a peaker plant that only t fires up on those peak times, right? The point of this battery was actually to outbid all the peaker plants. And they thought they'd get a few, right? They'd get it, they'd be able to spin it up quickly and do all that stuff. This battery wins every time. Every single time. It produ produces power quick enough and fast enough that none of the other plants in Australia can spin up fast enough and uh, bid on that power. So it's kind of interesting. Um, in Florida, actually Florida Power and Light just announced it's going to replace uh, both, both of their uh, uh, gas-fired plants and replace those with solar farms and 
a battery system that's actually larger than the one in Australia. Okay, let's talk about cars really quick. This is like my area of expertise. <laughs> this is uh, LA in um, Thanksgiving. And as you know, a lot of people drive over Thanksgiving. This actually goes on, so I'm going to just skip ahead here, sorry. <laughs> um, and uh, global ca uh, electric cars are actually um, uh, being produced and, and coming out all the time. You hear about it all the time. Actually, China is the largest car market. You, some people think it's the US. Um, this is a, a slide that I actually put together on my own. This is off script a little bit. But um, you know, the most common car that a lot of people measure against is the Toyota Camry, right? It's the most popular passenger car. Um, and this just kind of shows that price decrease with electric cars, as I mentioned before, that sticker price parity, as we call it, um, currently forecasted to be around 2022. So when you go to the dealer and look at cars, the electric car will actually be cheaper um, than the gas car. Electric cars are actually already cheaper that's another common misconception. Yes, thank you, my, my, my friend from Berkeley. Um, because you have to think about the total cost of ownership, right? People don't think about that, right? How much am I going to pay in gas for the lifetime of this vehicle, right? Um, so when you include the gas price, it actually already is cheaper. Um, but what's kind of neat is to look at the sticker price uh, parity and how fast that's coming down. So. Uh, What's actually really interesting, too, is that a lot of countries are already planning to phase out fossil fuels completely. Um, a lot of the Nordic countries are the leaders here, um, Scandinavian countries, excuse me, uh, like Denmark and Iceland in 2030. That's coming up quick, man. Can you imagine? That's pretty crazy. Um, China says in the near future, the, there's a crazy rumor that they are going to go with 2030, which is mind-blowing. That would be amazing because, like I said, they're the largest car market. Um, so that would be pretty wild. Uh, another one that I think is really cool, just uh, in the last year, an electric car is actually one of the top 10 selling cars. Pas those are passenger cars, by the way, not trucks. These are all the auto manufacturers that have committed to moving to electric vehicles. And General Motors, of course, is, uh, believes the future is electric. Now, if you ask me, I actually think they're transitioning too slow, but that's right. At least they're working on it. Uh, this is a, something I put together. I get a lot of questions like, well, what is the miles per gallon, right? What is the miles per gallon of your electric car? Um, so a little bit of fuzzy math, but basically we, this, this chart here uses a Toyota Camry, uh, which is uh, about 26 miles per gallon. And the Tesla Model 3 is 130. That's well, not bad. <laughs> okay, boats. What? Of course. We got to talk about boats, right? This is a river. Does anybody recognize this? It's a ferry. Good. Good. <laughs> Come on, guys. This is the new ferry that goes to Amherst Island. It's being built right now. It is completely electric. Do you guys know that? Yes, and guess what? There's another one replacing the Wolf Islander. So that one launches 2021, and I believe this launches this summer. So just talking quickly about the workforce, uh, 11 million people work directly in the renewable energy sector. Um, and solar and wind jobs have actually outgrown the market by six times. It's pretty incredible. Solar installer is one of the fastest growing job categories, actually. And I know there's a lot of wind fans here, right? So, uh, sorry, I couldn't help that dad joke. Um, but there's also uh, pretty popular wind turbine service technicians as well. You hear a lot about coal jobs, right? Well, actually, there's a lot more solar jobs. <laughs> um, also, the uh, Tesla has been working on a new type of solar panel that's actually a solar tile. So if you don't really like that ugly look of the solar panel, you can actually just have a roofing material that's a solar panel, and you can't even tell that it's a solar panel. Um, 
They look great. They have a couple different models, like you could get like a Spanish tile or slate or whatever. Um, but what's really cool is these are made right in Buffalo. And they're scaling up uh, this quarter, which is really exciting. And um, they're already doing training for uh, solar installers uh, and all that stuff. It is really exciting to have a factory right in Buffalo. Real quickly, one of my favorite slides. Um, we studied history in high school, right? We learned about the agricultural revolution. We learned about the industrial revolution, how cool that was. I grew up in the digital revolution, right? So I know that one pretty well. I really believe that the next revolution is around sustainability, right? We've done this many times before in history. We've completely reorganized our economy around new form, or, in, or sorry, we've reorganized the economy around different forms of work and uh, other things. And I think it's time that we need to do that again with uh, healthy and equitable growth. Thank you. I didn't know that slide would be so popular. I'm just going to, can I just have like 10 minutes, five minutes? I'm going to get in trouble. Come on, former intern. Ah, right. All right, I'm going to flip ahead really quickly. I'll go really quick. So, so will we change? OK, Paris Climate Accord, as you may know, our current president said we were backing out. Actually, he can't do that because we have to wait till 2020 after the election. Somebody was smart about it. Um, and actually, China and India are actually already on track to achieve their Paris commitment, um, which is super cool. 24 states representing 55% of the American people formed an alliance to actually hit all the Paris climate targets without the federal government. Um, do you guys know her? <laughs> okay, um, anyway, she came out against that, which is super cool. I thought that was neat. Um, a lot of cities are actually already committed to 100% uh, renewable, and uh, some have already gotten there. There's Burlington right there, awesome. Um, and uh, California is already there for in 2045, not to outdo them, not that there's a rivalry, but New York is doing uh, 2040. Okay, I'm gonna skip ahead through the coal plants. Sorry. All right. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'm trying to get to the best part here. Just bear with me. This is powering past coal. A lot of companies have already committed to um, uh, reducing their, their climate uh, impact. And, oh my God, just bear with me, I'm almost there. <laughs> and these are uh, clean purchase agreements, clean power purchase agreements. Oh, quick, hey, really quickly, what you can do. This is the best part. Uh, join the Citizens Climate Lobby. This is a really cool caucus where uh, if a Republican or a Democrat wants to join, they have to pull someone from the other party. Super awesome. <laughs> Go to Voters Edge, put in your zip code. You can figure out the candidates. It's really easy. Just search for the word climate, yeah. right? So easy. Um, contact your representative. You can scan that QR code when I email you the slides later. Uh, host a climate action night. That's me with my neighbors. I made them come over and eat my food. That's my friend giving public comment. You can do that. They actually won. Albany, California is now 100% renewable. So awesome. Uh, that Joro is a simple app you can use to figure out your carbon footprint on your own. Seven days of sustainability. I recommend Meatless Monday. It's a great way to start. We don't need meat every day of the week. This is my friend's solar system in Haiti. It's awesome. It's 100% renewable. He built it completely by himself. That's me protesting in front of Toyota. Join a protest if you can. This is, my, um, this is a toolkit I put together for startups. I didn't even mention that. I st uh, th I'm on my second startup right now. Um, and I wrote a, um, a toolkit for any startup or SaaS company to uh, achieve net zero by themselves. My company is now 100% renewable as of uh, January 1st. Um, and this is the name of that toolkit. I thought that was kind of neat. <laughs> Steal these offsets. We want people to share that. Engage other people. Be creative. This is my friend dancing in a park for five hours straight about for a uh, carbon-free future. Take five-minute actions. Put a poster in your window. Take 30-minute actions. Write to the TI Sun, Watertown Daily Times, Syracuse paper. Sign a petition. And most importantly, you should totally do this training too. If you look right there, that circle, that red circle there, that was me. Ah, oh, yeah, that's me right there in Seattle. 
Um, but there are five of them this year. It's a record number of them. You should totally sign up and go to it. It's amazing. I highly recommend it. And you should totally do it because your world depends on it. Thank you.